podcast. I'm Doc Renfro here with esteemed alum Aaron Ridgely, officers uh, or an officer of Marines, a lieutenant, infantry, Marine Corps officer. Aaron, how the hell are you? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> as good as can be under the circumstances of a wild pandemic and a wild election. Uh, remind me, uh, you were, of course, a UNI poli sci grad. What year did you graduate? Because I know it seems like a million years ago to me, and probably you, but what year was it? Uh, spring 2017. 2017. And yep. uh, you went directly into the Marine Corps, didn't you? About a couple months after the graduation. So, months. yeah. And class then, of us, yes. Um, Got your infantry MOS, which we'll we'll talk about later. Basically, Aaron has done, conventionally speaking, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think as far as conventional uh, basic entry-level training, uh, officer candidate school for the Marine Corps would be widely considered to be the toughest and roughest one. And then... After that, you got your infantry officer school, which would again be for that level, I, as far as I know, conventionally speaking, as far as an intro level course, the roughest and toughest one, statistically speaking, as far as attrition rates and all that jazz. Is that, would that be uh, about correct? Yeah, that's uh, accurate representation. I mean, uh, at, the, at the graduation ceremony, we had the, the director, Major Bradford, there. Uh, who, he, you know, he spoke about it, but uh, regarded the course as the most difficult conventional uh, military training uh, that exists. And yeah. so that would be from my understanding as well. Uh, so that's all awesome. We'll, we'll talk about that. But first, why don't we talk about where you're from? How how did you end up at uh, UNI's campus here in Cedar Falls, Iowa? So I uh, grew up in Sioux City, Iowa um, until I was 18 and left for college. I had no idea where I wanted to go until my senior year, where my buddy was actually going to play football. He got a full ride scholarship to play football at University of Northern Iowa, one of my close friends, and kind of convinced me to walk on to the football team. Uh, I got cut after like the first, one of the first tryouts or something like that. I had never played linebacker before, so it was a far reach. Um, and it actually worked out in my benefit. Uh, I benefited from uh, not playing football or not, you know, and actually focusing on the academic side uh, first and foremost. Um, but uh, yeah, just was going to go to Iowa State uh, College of Engineering um, originally and wasn't great at math, didn't like calculus that much. So I uh, decided, you know, liberal arts is kind of more my forte and uh ended up at UNI and uh yeah so for the most part didn't know what I wanted to do when I got there either uh, completely undecided yeah well which is common you know and I right. tell people the same thing uh I mean I started out as a as a government major is what they call it Texas and then switched to geography and if you had told me my freshman sophomore or any time when I was in college I was going to get a PhD in political science and be a professor, you know, that would have laughed in the face. Uh, so a lot of students start out, I think the majority, even those that think they know what they're going to do. Uh, it's, it's, you know, sometimes it's hitting that elective and the right prof or the right course at the right time in your life. And then you're hooked and it's stuff you may never have thought of before. So did you uh, start out as a poli sci major? Um, I believe I ha I was on the criminology route to begin with. And uh, I had enough college credits from my, my senior year of high school to actually double major. And so the more classes I took um, in the political science field, that's what I, I wanted the emphasis to be on. Um, which it somewhat turned out to be. I got, a, I think, a minor in international affairs as well. But uh, yeah, it started out, I believe, as criminology. It started out undecided. 
I think I was looking at philosophy or something like that, which was cool, but uh, didn't know what job field I was going to go into after that. Um, and I just don't like case law, so that wouldn't have been very good. Um, and then, yeah, I just I think it was the electives. I think it was the the university almost forcing uh, the, the whole liberal arts, the well-rounded education, um, forcing you to experience things that you normally wouldn't have taken prior um, that genuinely helped out in terms of, you know, searching for the, the, the major that would best suit my interests and, and what I wanted to go into. So. Yes. And see, this is a key point. A lot of students while they're here, especially early on, uh, might have disdain for these liberal arts requirements. But later on in life, they're always thankful for the exposure, whether you end up majoring in a liberal art or not. It's the idea of this well-rounded education uh, that you eloquently mentioned is so important. Um, and then, you know, yeah, you never know what, what turns you on. So you become, when do you declare poli-sci as a major? I think, uh, so I think I took one of your international security classes and I don't remember why I was in that class because I know that was one of your more advanced courses. Um, but I think that was my sophomore year and I think it was, uh, spring of my sophomore year is when I actually declared political sciences as my major and started the, uh, the bulk of the coursework for it. Outstanding. And uh, did you have a, a concentration at all, or were you more broadly interested? Um, the uh, international affairs, um, terrorism, insurgency, human rights, that, that kind of stuff. The, uh, I guess, yeah, the, the IR portion of it was, was mostly what I was, uh, I wanted the emphasis to be in. Yeah, and I suppose... You know, this is a good point because, and, and we'll get into your decision making on what you know what you decided to do after graduation here in a minute. Where I guess we should probably do that now because you decided to embark on a journey as a Marine Corps officer. Um, so I'm curious as to if you had specific political science courses that may have helped you in that, you know, because I've talked to law students and, and that lawyers now and PhD students and, you know, grad students and law students primarily thus far in this first season of the Panther political science podcast. Mm -hmm. And uh, you sort of chose a big boy job right off the, uh, the get go there. And so I'm wondering if there was anything uh, course-wise, educationally, that the department was able to do for you to prepare you for the unique challenges academically, psychologically, and physically that you've gone through really over the last three years. Yeah, um, se several courses. Um, terrorism insurgency, I think one of your courses, foreign policy. Um, and even the the fundamental, like the baseline courses, comparative politics. Um, I think there was an international law course that I took, um, and all of these things translated. Uh, all like every every piece of coursework in some way translated into the job that I that I, I have right now. Um, and the most interesting part is how it's sort of uh, like this is going to kind of sound like you know cocky, but uh, it, it set me up ahead of my peers, um, except for, you know, some Naval Academy graduates. Right. Um, it set me ahead of them because they came into the Marine Corps with, uh, different, different degrees, whether it was psychology, you know, some of these guys have master's degrees in like business. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, when it comes down to it, I was talking to, you know, field grades or operations officer for the battalion, the, uh, battalion XO at these, you know, uh, staff and O meetings about, uh, you know, situations uh, arising around the world from uh, the whole thing with Kasim Soleimani and the, and the Quds Force that happened recently and uh, being able to speak intelligently to the higher ups um, has been, you know, 
not a not a great boost to the career because it, it but it just helps in terms of networking and being able to you know speak to them intelligently about about things pertinent to the job right and i think no doubt uh it helps you as a younger officer be taken seriously now as an old intel guy myself i know that leaders are not always happy to hear things that they didn't know <laughs> or that doesn't but, uh, confirm their preconceived notions but you know, speaking of Qasem Soleimani, this is a perfect example of a little, a little. I think I, I gave a whole lecture on he was the most important man in the Middle East you had never heard of. Mm -hmm. And then I remember when the Trump administration decided to take him out. I found out first from you, and then I saw I got a New York Times alert. Uh, but it, it was interesting. Um, I've also, you know, it's funny, I've had students that were on job interviews and saying, have contacted me and said just a little thing like knowing ISIS is better referred to as Dash. Right. Can be very impressive uh, to people. And, you know, in our department, you have such a wide variety of courses, you know, mm -hmm. everything from terrorism and insurgency, which no doubt. Uh, is this, you know, a good course for someone in your career to have taken, but also think of the theory courses, the everything on uh, courses from Africa politics to Asian to South American politics, mm -hmm. uh, political economy, constitution, American, you know, or, or, you know, public bureaucracy, all these things. Uh, you know, the old, the old joke is. If you can't find something in the Department of Political Science at UNI that floats your boat, then you got to check for a pulse, man, you know. Uh, the hard part, though, is getting people to to recognize that and, and sort of to, to get them turned on. Because I think the idea is, oh, you know, I'm a freshman. I want to major in something that is going to get me a job and get me the cabbage. Uh, and all they're thinking about is a career. And that's understandable, it's, you know, and it's understandable that parents would have that view. Mm -hmm. But the problem is you never know what's going to turn you on. And if you look at something like political science, it's so broad. Um, it, it's, you know, to me, it's a no brainer. Some of the opportunities that are offered. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you had any words of wisdom on that. Yeah, I mean, uh Ultimately, what the the program did is that every freshman comes into college thinking they know everything there is to know about everything. Um, you know, they're probably intimidated to the coursework in college to begin with. But, um, you know, there's this level of, well, I'm a, you know, I'm going to college. I must know everything. Um, and then what really kind of intrigued me about the the political science side of things was. Um, everything that I knew was fundamentally wrong um, because I was relying on, you know, biases and preconceived notions that I held uh, through, as you know, from learning through either the TV or, the, you know, my family, uh, which nobody's in any way, shape or form an expert in my family um, on politics and, you know, stuff like that. But I think that was the most intriguing part was... Um, it, it, you know, it forced me to confront a lot of biases that I had and it, it forced me to, you know, reconstruct uh, what, how the world actually is, how it actually operates, um, who benefits from what, what interests are where. Um, and so I think that's what the coursework I pulled mainly out of the coursework um, and out of that program was uh, just analysis and not, you know, going off of uh, whatever some pundit is telling you. Uh, or whatever podcast you're listening to and having your own your own baseline and your own analysis of, of, of what to think uh, and then ultimately that's what that's what the program does is it gives you your own tools to do so right it, well I, I think you've just defined critical thinking right is what we're all about critical thinking and the ability to communicate well uh, both in the written form and orally which I'm sure have served you well. Um, what do you have any uh, 
favorite books that are still your favorite books that maybe uh, you got turned on to in your career at, at you and I? Yeah, uh, I think Bury the Chains. Um, I think by Hoffman. That yeah, was Hot Shots. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's right. That was uh, that was a fantastic book. Um, anything by Kilcullen was great. Um, yeah, I, I mean those books, you know, Pulitzer Prize winning stuff. So, I mean, uh, fantastic all around. And uh, the uh, the uh, Samantha Power book. Oh, Problem from Hell about yeah. genocide. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, Speaking of Kill Colin, I'm wondering, do they mention him at Quantico nowadays, or is he an uh, past? Huh? Uh, him and John Boyd are kind of. Uh, what, what about Nagel? Uh, actually, yes. I talked to a uh, a Marine uh, when we were at uh, OCS together. He's a, he's a lieutenant now, um, and he said that he actually does a book reading club with a bunch of other officers because his dad's a colonel. And somehow, you know, networking, he gets invited to this stuff. And he said, Nagel's always there. Oh. And so I said, well, you know, that'd be cool if I could get an invite sometime. But I'm a little too far away from Quantico to do that. Yeah, I didn't know if these guys would be uh, outcasted or not uh, because of the whole sort of turn away from counterinsurgency. Mm -hmm. Petraeus, you know, from the Petraeus Mattis counterinsurgency manual. My understanding was... You know, back in my day, that was the new latest and greatest thing. And everybody all of a sudden was a coin theorist. And, but now, 12 years later, uh, you know, it just hasn't worked. And so I didn't know if they were uh, just not talking about it or maybe they're talking about it, but, but are more critical on trying to figure out the difference between the cost-benefit analysis, really, of, of counterinsurgency versus counterterrorism and what's best from a u.s you know security perspective considering considering domestic politics you know we happen to not live in an authoritarian society so you have these pain in the ass uh, amendments like the first and the rest of the bill of rights that say people get to have a freedom of speech and debate this stuff and right. so unlike unlike our near peers in uh, moscow or beijing uh, we can't just say we're going to do this and then just do it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. What, what do you think? Has there been a turn? Uh, here's a question. Has there been a turn against, because you, you have this very fresh train. Um, has there been, in your view, a turn against this notion of Petraeus Mattis counterinsurgency back to something more, um, shall we say, for lack of a better word, simple, like counterterrorism? Um, not that I've necessarily noticed. Um, if I had something to compare it to maybe two decades ago, uh, that would be uh, a little easier. But, uh, I mean, we're still trained in, in coin ops. I mean, we, uh, in Quantico, uh, in different places, they'll actually enlist the, uh, the help of actors who um, – you know, work in the village and live in the village and uh, who like speak a different language. And I think they, uh, I think they spoke Tagalog. Most of the actors spoke Tagalog and um, we actually had a Marine who spoke Tagalog. So, so this is, this is training for the Marine Corps Special uh, Operations Forces in the Philippines. Then. Right. Uh, no, it was just the actors who were just, uh, oh, they needed somebody, Isn't they needed somebody with, yeah, they're from Phil the Philippines. But they needed somebody who had a foreign a foreign language, and I don't know if they could find a lot of people with Arabic. I, I see. They were just trying to make it a different. Right, right. Um, but they try to. That's one of the ways they sort of bring the fidelity into the training is um, enlisting people who don't necessarily speak English as their first language, and then um, evaluating uh, the, the Marines on how they interact with people in the village and how uh, the uh, the different. Um, uh, key leadership engagements, stuff like that, the KLEs that that have to be conducted with uh, village elders, for example. Um, so they're they're still practicing a lot of that, um, and I haven't necessarily seen a turn away from it. But I know um, it's coin is a very complicated and complex uh, thing to actually conduct, 
um, as far as, you know, at the, even at the small unit level, at the platoon and the company level, it's a very difficult thing. And even at the, the strategic and operational level, it becomes completely um, inherently more complex. So, yeah, I mean, what I say now, uh, with hindsight being 2020, is that COIN really had us all convinced. Uh, but it turns out it's, it's, it, it becomes just a euphemism for nation building. Mm -hmm. And the problems are you can build the schools and build the wells, but the bad guys come and blow them up. Right. So you got to do bad guy elimination first and foremost. Mm -hmm. That's surprisingly, you know, compared to, you know, relatively speaking, it's surprisingly easy and cheap to do, especially now with satellites and drones. We have, as you know, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance assets like never before. Right. Uh, almost too information, uh, too much information for the commander. I mean, commander, battlefield commanders now have more information than people like Napoleon or Eisenhower or anybody in the past could have possibly imagined. Yep. You know, even Tommy Franks is recently, I mean, the ability to know in real time where everyone is, is amazing. And uh, I think there's a learning curve, though, that's still. Old colonels and generals uh, older than me would probably have a problem with. So fortunately, they're teaching, uh, you know, your peer group how to deal with all of this information. You know, I, we're, we're even running into these issues. Um, infantry officer course, uh, we started again in some of the nitty gritty of drones and uh, some of the uh, the S6 capabilities of linking up computers and, and radios and using different networking uh, to communicate, whether it's uh, like SATCOM and, and, and different different things that I think have been available for quite a while. But uh, now the Marine Corps, you know, they trained us on drones uh, at the small unit level, either at the squad level, at the platoon level. And it's difficult because there's not a lot of doctrine. There's not a lot of uh, things written on this stuff. Uh, it's actually, you know, be able to use it to its, you know, best capabilities i guess and so and, and we're getting even smaller with it now so every every squad in the marine corps is going to have a drone operator a radio operator and ultimately it's to uh to decrease uh the uh this the signature of of the units that are moving away from these these mass mass engagements and moving to more of a special operations approach throughout the entire infantry in the marine corps um as we you know start to look at the the peer and near peer threats of russia and and, and, you know, PRC, um, eliminating the signatures and more dispersed operations. And I think that the Commandant uh, had it in his, uh, his planning guidance that he released last year. So pretty interesting stuff and very nuanced. And uh, it's going to be huge to actually get the individuals the training on it is the, uh, is, the, is the key part to this, though. Yeah, so that's awesome. Uh, my next question was going to be, does the Marine Corps actually own drones and it sounds like they do now why uh let me just for the audience uh define a couple of terms that aaron used there s6 this is a staff position that has to do with communications so he was talking about there and when he talked about the commandant he's talking about the the boss of the marine corps uh, mass maneuver warfare versus asymmetric this is a long time in coming uh, did you ever read Colonel Thomas X. Ham's Sling on the Stone? Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, he was talking about this. We are very world's best, unquestioned. Uh, if you close with and engage head-to-head -head, a battalion of Marines, you will lose. I I any enemy the world over is well aware of this, right? But that only creates another problem. So what if the enemy refuses to close with and engage you? You know, the example I always give my class, I'm going to have to update this one of these days, but I still use Mike Tyson as the example. And so far, it seems like everybody still recognizes the name Mike Tyson. And I say, look, if you get in a boxing ring with Mike Tyson, you know, are you sure that you're going to lose? Of course, you're going to lose. If you close with and engage Mike Tyson. But what if 
you have an appointment with Mike Tyson to meet in the boxing ring at noon, but you don't get in the boxing ring. Instead, you booby trap it or you put a sniper up in the stadium. Obviously, you're violating well-known rules and laws and so forth, but guess what? You beat Mike Tyson in the ring. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a, the asymmetric warfare paradox that we're in as a as a country that abides by law of armed conflict and all sorts of demonic conventions. We're not going to cheat or, or do illegal things like this, but the idea is that our enemies will. So, you know, how do you deal with that becomes a real question. Right. Right. And adapting, uh, adapting the battlefield. Uh, to better suit uh, the individuals uh, who, whose interests are at play, I suppose. Um, but yeah, I mean, we in what's funny about the Marine Corps is we're we're no longer really focused on the asym the asymmetrical warfare stuff because we're moving into this power competition with with China and Russia. going back going back to great power conflict. That's interesting, right? Yeah. Right, and uh, we're so we're talking more so about that nowadays, opposed as opposed to the asymmetrical stuff, asymmetrical uh, warfare with uh, individuals who refuse to, you know, look, you know, be engaged, refuse to actually um, become decisively engaged with your units, because like as you were saying, um, even at the company level with the uh, the company organic firepower, uh, it's almost suicide for an underfunded um, and sometimes undertrained unit uh, to pick a fight with uh, individuals who have formal tactical training, as well as uh, so much firepower at their disposal that they can even start pulling from, you know, the company can start pulling from battalions assets and regimental assets and from batteries. Um, And that's what's, you know, great about the Marine Corps is, you know, we have all these other assets at our disposal. Well, yeah, that's right. Land, sea, and air. I mean, uh, if the, uh, I would say M16s, but now what? Everybody has M4s. Uh, and they have M27s, IRs. Jeez. So M27s, if they don't get you the artillery, and if the artillery doesn't get you, you have uh, the naval ships, often where you can coordinate with them. Uh, right. So it's, it would just be, like you say, almost suicidal to me uh, to go symmetrically. I can't think of a foreign fighting force that could pull that off. So it's interesting that you, you're saying they're going away from asymmetric and looking more at this great power conflict. I know the Army has always, not always necessarily, but has recently been pushing for this uh, because they're concerned about tank, you know, friggin' tank battles with Russia. You know, with Russia. And to me, um, that's not a huge concern, but it certainly is from the Army's perspective. So, I, you know what the Marine Corps is saying as far as what, what they're worried about? Because the Army is worried about tanks with Russia. Uh, well, Marine Corps isn't that worried about tanks anymore since we just we just got rid of them. Uh, every you tank is... You don't have any tanks anymore? Marine Corps got rid of the tanks. We have no more tanks. You got tank killers? Uh, we, have, we still have CAT teams, uh, combined arm anti-tank uh, teams uh, that are battalion organic that still have toes, uh, saber systems. Well, I didn't know. I didn't know that. So Marine Corps has no more tank guys. What? What? Where the tank guys go? I think they had a lot moved to different MOSs. So I think a lot of the tankers probably went to uh, track companies. Um, so they're with the uh, AAVs, the amphibious assault vehicles, or they went um, with the uh, LAR community, the uh, light armor reconnaissance uh, vehicle community, LAVs. Um, because it's more their forte, uh, you know, same stuff, but I'm, I'm almost certain that's what happened. Um, because there's a, you know, there's a large community of tankers out there, mm-hmm. but, uh, yeah, Amtrak's are still, uh, well and alive. I think we're getting brand new AVs, so that's good for their career. Um, well, yeah. And so what do you do? I mean, it has a lot of the same capabilities. So we're talking here about a way for, for armor to move in. That can also do explosive violence. So I mean, right. they're, they're going to have what artillery, rockets, fifty cal's. Plus, they give they make it to where small arms fire is not going to affect 
the guy's is you know in shelter in or right. behind that tank, right? Or or that armored vehicle, I suppose. Right. And so again with uh, the commandant's planning guidance, he's he's uh really emphasizing um fires in terms of uh more so our our battle plans for, for the next big conflict, the, the fires portion, whether it's uh artillery, uh close air support, um bombs and uh what else is there? High Mars, the new the new big thing, High Mars, the uh the, I don't even know what it stands for anymore. But it's just a big truck with the big rockets on it, big missile systems that can uh, for the most part obliterate a kilometer by kilometer grid square. And so, it, uh, it's a tank like vehicle. I mean you wouldn't call it a tank, but it's well it's got wheels instead of traffic. It's, it's uh it's portable and I think they just throw them on trucks. <laughs> that's awesome okay yeah. well i mean we could i could talk for the for the audience before we get too deep in this i I could obviously talk to to aaron for hours but we want to keep it uh in a reasonable time zone here um tell me uh is there anything you feel like the department of political science oh uh, could improve on, or did we let you down in any way, or do you feel like we trained you up, practically speaking, as good as we could, or what do you think? I thought it was completely sufficient. Um, I, again, I have nothing really to compare it to, but I don't think I could have found a better program. Uh, to be quite honest, I know when we went to. Uh, uh, the, the whole Stratcom thing uh, at Offutt Air Force Base out here in Omaha. Um, I mean, there were other huge time schools. I think you know all these strategic universities that are uh, almost like think tanks uh, were out here as well. And it was interesting to see you, you know you represented there the University of Northern Iowa. So I think that says something about uh, the the program in and of itself. Uh, but other than that, I mean, the program was fantastic. Uh, it covered all the bases for the most part. I mean, you know, it set me up for success uh, in the Marine Corps. 100% set me up for success in you know every every facet of of the job I currently hold. So, well, that's that's great to hear. Uh, speaking of great things to hear, shouldn't be too long until you're pinning on captain. Right. Uh, I think the promotion year? board, uh, something like that. The promotion board, I think for some of my peer group who commissioned a couple of months before me, I think they're, uh, I think they're on the board. So I, I haven't checked it. Um, I, I, it might be within like a year, maybe year and a half. I'm not completely sure. Yeah. Well, it won't be too long and, uh, that'll be a big, that's a nice promotion. Uh, because, right. Because it's fun to call the Navy when you're <laughs> when you're a captain from a different service. Yeah. Because uh, if you call a Navy recruiter or a uh, or more commonly say you're going to stay at a hotel that is owned by the Navy, say in Honolulu, and you identify yourself as uh, Captain Ridgely, well, let's just say that your quarters might be a little different. Yeah, it might be like the field grade quarters. <laughs> That's right. So for the listeners, the Navy has a little bit of a idiosyncratic rank structure where their captains are equivalent to Army, or Marine Corps, or Air Force colonels, whereas a captain in, in all the other services is a, still a junior officer. It's a very senior officer, so when you call up and you identify yourself by that rank, uh, everybody scrambles. So you'll enjoy that, Aaron. That'll be a right. big uh, <laughs> Right. All right. Well, unless you have any final words, this has been a, a great conversation. And I could go on forever, but I better I better push the pause button here. Um, any last words of wisdom for prospective or current students? Uh, you know, take uh, you decide to go into political science. Take it deadly seriously because uh, the uh, ultimately, you know, political game, I guess, determines a lot of things for a lot of people. Um, and so it's a, it's a very serious endeavor. Um, 
because uh, what you'll end up doing most likely outside of if you if you graduate with a political science degree will be uh, sort of a, uh, a service position um, in service to, to somebody uh, if you go with uh, the path that was created through your political science degree. So uh, take it seriously. Um, all of this stuff is holds a lot of significance, a lot of weight, um, especially understanding the, uh, the decision makers and uh, you know, you'll get a lot out of that through the uh, curriculum that you, you and I, uh, the, um, the, the psychological theories that go into all this stuff and understanding, uh, you know, everything is uh, not what it seems at face value. Um, and so, yeah, that's, uh, that's about all I got. Great. Well, Aaron, Lieutenant Ridgely, you've uh, been uh, very gracious with your time and I certainly appreciate it. And uh, we will uh, hopefully be able to get together soon at some point if this whole situation that we're living through ever passes. Right, hopefully. Counting. Oh.